Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Honor, and thank you all of you for coming here today. So, um, yeah, my name is Ribu Kaul, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, a project that uh, that I worked on recently. And uh, my goal is actually twofold. In addition to telling you about my research, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about what uh, condensed matter theory is and uh, how fundamental physics, and what I mean by, because when you think of fundamental physics, people often think of uh, you know standard models, string theory, cosmology. People don't always think of material science. And so uh, I'd like to begin by giving you a talk, uh, 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 what I think is, you know, what for many condensed matter theorists is a dream situation of how uh, something very fundamental arose from uh, a very complicated material. Okay, so, so the goal of our field in some sense in condensed matter theory is to study phenomena that occur in materials and try and build very simple models of quantum physics and statistical mechanics from these uh, uh, materials. Yeah, so that'll be my introduction, which I hope uh, uh, is very accessible and will be uh, of interest to uh, people from different fields. And then I'll tell you a little bit about my research uh, on uh, this material, cobalt niobate. Okay, so let's begin by just watching a video. That's something that's uh, easy for all of us to do. And it's amazing, this experiment, you know, that I'm gonna show you a video of, probably was done, I don't know, five, 600 years ago for the first time. It's a very cheap experiment. And I'm gonna try and argue in the introduction that this is, you know, in some sense, one of the very profound experiments of 20th century physics. Okay, so uh, the experiment involves a, a magnet here and another magnet, two magnets and a blowtorch. Okay, so there's something that you could do with not uh, much money. And so uh, if you watch this video, uh, this magnet is being heated, it's put under the other magnet, and then uh, you wait for a little while, and then suddenly it's attracted to the other magnet. So uh, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very simple experiment, uh, but I'm gonna argue that this experiment is really profound. Its interpretation was, is, you know, uh, let, let me tell you about it. Okay. So uh, what is the picture of why uh, any material becomes magnetic? Like uh, we know iron, the bar magnet is uh, magnetic. And it turns out that uh, you really need quantum mechanics to understand the phenomena of magnetism. Okay, so it turns out if you just have classical statistical mechanics model, you cannot get magnetism. And in fact, uh, you know, the electron spin is a very uh, uh, important source of magnetism in materials. So uh, you've all learned that you know, every little electron uh, has a tiny bar magnet attached to it. You can think of it that way as a small magnetic field. And so when a magnet is magnetic, uh, the electrons inside the little bar magnets inside, this is a high school picture of magnetism. Uh, they all align. And so these little magnetic fields that each of these bar magnets creates adds, and you get a macroscopic magnetic field, which then results in you know, attraction and repulsion the way you've, you see in familiar uh, experience with uh, magnets. On the other hand, if you heat a ma ma uh, magnet, what happens is that these uh, little bar magnets then sort of misalign and become random and they cancel each other's magnetic field. And so this is the sort of high school explanation of the experiment I just showed you. Right? that if you heat up a magnet, it becomes non-magnetic because of random fluctuations and at very low temperatures it aligns. Okay, so uh, this explanation is interesting. It's, uh, it's, it combined, you know, it, it sort of emerged in the early part of the 20th century and combined two of the great physic, physics disciplines, quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics uh, in this explanation of magnetism. And so the amount of magnetism that a system has, you know, you learn in a uh, e &M class is called magnetization. And this becomes temperature dependent because of thermal fluctuations. And at some point, thermal fluctuations are so large that they destroy magnetism completely. Okay, so this is the high school level explanation. Now let's take that one step higher and try and write down a quantitative model for this phenomenon. Okay, so uh, it turns out that this was first attempted in the 1920s by a uh, someone called Ernst Ising. He was a graduate student in Germany. He was a graduate student of Lenz, Wilhelm Lenz. And they made a very, very crude model. Okay, so this is, this is where fundamental physics emerges from complex materials because you say, okay, you see this phenomena in a magnet and then you don't try and make a detailed description of the material because the material is extremely complicated, but you just try and make the simplest cartoon model that shows this phenomena of magnetization. 
So that's what he attempted to do. And so he said, well, you know, in reality, electrons are moving around in space. Let's forget about that. And let's just put them on a regular lattice. So it was known that time that metals, you know, crystallize in regular lattices. So this seemed like a reasonable thing to do, even though it was very cartoonish. And then let's assume that on each side of this lattice, there's a little bar magnet that can only point up or down. So in some sense, even though the origin of the bar magnet is quantum, the treatment of quantum mechanics is now sort of forgotten and the system is just treated like a classical object that can only point up or down. Then he said, well, let's imagine that, uh, you know, spins interact locally with their neighbors and the spins like to align. And so we give it uh, an energy which has this form. So I'm assuming that all of you have seen this model before, so I won't discuss it pedagogically. But basically this energy interaction likes spins to point parallel and they can point either both up or both down. And then what you do is you imagine this whole system with this energy function is in contact with a the thermal reservoir. And so you get statistical, you study it with statistical mechanics uh, with this partition function. Okay, so I'm sure that all of you have seen this model at least in graduate statistical mechanics. The solution of this model is uh, maybe a little more complicated, but what I want to tell you in this introduction is this model and the study of it has led to some of the most profound ideas in theoretical physics in the 20th century. And in fact, we're not done solving this model. There's still lots of questions about this very simple model that we don't understand uh, the answer to. Okay, so what profound things am I talking about in theoretical physics? Okay, so let's take this model and it's in thermal equilibrium. And then we're imagining tuning it as a function of temperature. So if you want to imagine configurations of the model, um, you know, you can imagine uh, these kind of pictures where, you know, these green spins point up and the gray spins point down. So at very high temperatures, you want to maximize entropy. And so you have configurations in which the spins fluctuate up and down. And if you go to very low temperatures, then most of the spins want to be parallel. But again, because of thermal fluctuations, there are some that point uh, uh, down and some point up. So now if you look at an, you know, a little uh, average of the magnetization, which is the average magnetic moment in a little area, it looks like it's finite in this region and zero in this region. And so you might conclude that the picture for the magnetization uh, goes down. And this looks very much like the cartoon picture and like the experiment we saw. When you heat it up, it's non-magnetic. When you cool it down, it's uh, magnetic. Okay. But there is a little bit of a paradox. Okay. So the paradox is why do all the, when you go to low temperatures and you assume the magnetization is finite, how do you know whether it's positive or negative, right? In this model, both magnetic, uh, both positive and negative configurations come with equal energy. So that you, you think by statistical mechanics, they're equally likely. And so you might conclude actually that the Ising model doesn't magnetize from this paradox. Okay, it turns out the resolution to this paradox is one of those very profound phenomena that was first discovered in the Ising model. It's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this argument was first made by Rudolf Pyrrhus. It's a beautiful argument, which uh, balances uh, energy and entropy of the flipped spins. And based on this argument, he actually showed that in, if you have an infinitely big system in the so-called thermodynamic limit, in fact, this symmetry is broken. And this, this phenomena is, uh, not, is very central to our modern understanding. In fact, it's, it's, it's definitely the most important idea in statistical mechanics in the 20th century. And certainly people would argue it, it, it may be in the top 10 ideas in theoretical physics uh, in the 20th century. It plays a role not only in condensed matter physics, not only in magnetism and superconductivity, but also in the standard model of uh, particle physics. Okay, so if this is all the Ising model gave us, this would be enough to put it in textbooks. It turns out it gives us much more, okay? So in the uh, um, 70s or 60s, there was uh, lots of work trying to understand the phase transition of the Ising model. And this is a picture of Ken Wilson, who's one of my heroes in theoretical physics. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this problem is related to other problems in uh, particle physics that were confounding people at the time. And Wilson, in a very remarkable piece of work, many of us would argue that this, in the last 50 years, this was the most profound piece of uh, theoretical physics. Uh, it's called the renormalization group. I realized that, uh, you know, at the critical point, these configurations have strange forms, which actually resemble fractals. And uh, the distribution of these shapes are described by uh, conformal field theories. Um, and so here's another example where the Ising model was certainly a central part of this uh, development in theoretical physics. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about one more development. So I talked about spontaneous symmetry breaking. I spoke about uh, 
you know, phase transitions, critical phenomena, renormalization group. Uh, but I'm going to take a small detour before I talk about that. Okay, so the little detour I need to do is uh, we're talking about statistical mechanics, but we've learned maybe many of us that there's a profound connection between statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics. Okay, so the probability that appears in statistical mechanics and the probability that appears in quantum mechanics can be connected in a certain limit. Okay, so there's this idea which was popularized by Richard Feynman. I think other people were involved in developing it called the path integral. Okay, so the idea is that uh, all quantum problems in D dimensions are, if you look at their zero temperature properties, at least, their static zero temperature properties, they're related to statistical mechanics problems in one higher dimension, so D plus one dimensions. Okay, so, uh, and if you just want a simple explanation for why this is, if you take the quantum problem, you can rewrite it as a, as a thermal partition function. And the ground state, of course, the zero temperature limit of a thermal partition function, but you can recognize that this operator is just time evolution in an imaginary direction. And so imaginary time evolution actually becomes a statistical mechanics problem. Okay, so uh, this e to the minus beta h is just this time evolution in imaginary time. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with this idea that every quantum problem in D dimensions is equivalent to a stat-mech problem in D plus one dimensions, at least as far as the ground state of this problem is concerned. So natural question to ask is what 1D quantum model corresponds to 2D Ising model? So I introduced this 2D Ising model to you. And the question is what one dimensional quantum model would uh, uh, correspond to that? And it turns out this model is very important. Uh, we would argue that this is you know, the fundamental, most fundamental model of quantum many body physics. It's called the transverse field Ising model. Okay, so now notice that this is a Hamiltonian, it's a quantum, uh, object, and it's an object of spins which live on a line. So there are many, many spins, not just one quantum spin, but an infinitely many of them that live on a periodic uh, uh, row like this. Uh, neighboring spins interact with this sigma z, sigma z interaction, which is the so-called Ising interaction. And in addition to define this model and make it uh, 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 not sick, make it healthy, you have to introduce a transverse field. Okay, so the transverse field is applied uh, to conventionally in the x direction you could apply it in the y direction it's just important that it's perpendicular to this z direction okay so the spin up spin down flip symmetry of the ising model is represented as a unitary operator in quantum mechanics and that's simply a pi rotation uh, about the x-axis so notice a pi rotation about the x-axis keeps sigma x invariant but it changes the sign of sigma z because the two sigma z's it keeps this hamilton invariant and so it commutes with this hamiltonian okay so i've shown that uh, over here so we'll come back to talk about the symmetry uh, later in the talk Okay, so uh, it turns out now, so you can basically uh, think about uh, the 2D Ising model or the 1D transverse field Ising model, and they share lots of the same physics. Uh, the reason I wanted to introduce uh, this transverse field Ising model to you, it may be less familiar to you, but it's more relevant to the experiment that I'm gonna discuss. And it turns out some things become very simple to illustrate in the transverse field Ising model. Okay, so the last, so I, I spoke about spontaneous symmetry breaking and critical phenomena. And another remarkable thing that was invented in the Ising model is the idea of duality in statistical mechanics. Okay, so that's the last thing I want to introduce to you because that's going to play an important role in my talk. Uh, so here's the transverse field Ising model. And so rather than think of, you know, thermal averages, what we're interested in is the ground state wave function of the system. Okay, and ostensibly this is very complicated because if you have many, many spins, this ground state wave function lives in a Hilbert space, which is, you know, two raised to 10 raised to 23. So it's a giant Hilbert space. Okay, but we know a lot about the 1D transverse field Ising model. Uh, so let me just tell you what we know about the ground state wave function as model. Okay, so if you put the transverse field uh, to be zero or very small, then the system wants to minimize uh, the first term. And to minimize the first term, the spins have to align all parallel. And it has a choice to align all up or all down. And these two states are degenerate. And the system, again, by the phenomena of spontaneous symmetry breaking, picks one of these states. So I promise you that this is very similar to the, to the 2D Ising model. Now, on the other hand, if you apply a very large transverse field, then clearly what will happen is all the spins will align along the x direction. Now, notice that there's a very important, even though these two ground states look very similar, they're very, very different. And importantly, when you apply a large transverse field, the state in which the spins anti-align with the field is a very, very high energy state. So this state is unique, and this state is, has this doubly degenerate uh, structure. Okay, so this is what the ground state is. Now let's ask ourselves what the excitations are above the ground state. 
sorry, before I, 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 there's one more feature I want to talk about the ground state is if you apply a transverse field at some point, you reach a critical point where you transfer from a ferromagnet to the sort of trivial state. And in fact, this critical point is very closely tied to the 2D Ising critical point. And in fact, in this model, you can study the same conformal field theory and uh, fractal behavior of these uh, domain walls. Okay, so this is a ground state. It's a ferromagnet trivial and it's critical in between. And now I want to discuss what the excitations are. Okay, so let's begin with the trivial ground state where all the spins align. And I, I want to ask myself, what is the lowest excitation that I can create above this ground state? Okay, and clearly the lowest energy excitation I can create is a spin flip. Okay, so this spin flip uh, we call in condensed matter, it's like a particle. I mean, it's basically a particle. If you think of this as a discretization of quantum field theory, this is simply a, a, a particle because it's a it's completely local and it has a conservation law. It can move around. Now, one interesting feature is actually it has a conservation law, but it has a Z2 conservation law. So if you take two of them, they can actually annihilate. So they're not like the familiar particles we know which have particle conservation. Um, but nonetheless, they are particle excitations, they carry energy and uh, they're completely uh, localized. Okay, so this is the low energy particles in the trivial ground state. And now let's ask ourselves, what are the low energy uh, uh, excitations of the ferromagnetic ground state? Okay, and it turns out that this uh, question is actually very profound. And luckily we can just illustrate it with simple pictures. Okay, so naively you might first say, okay, the low energy excitation of this is just to flip a spin because that's what I did uh, when I made the transfer field very large. But you can convince yourself just by looking at these pictures that this is not the lowest energy excitation because when you flip a spin, you actually have two of these bonds which are unhappy. So remember the energy of the state is given by summing over bonds and the bond likes spins to be parallel. And so now you have two bonds which are anti-parallel and so the system is twice as unhappy. So what you would like to do instead is to flip a whole region of spins. Okay, so this is a very, very fundamental uh, the quantity to, to my talk, it's called a domain wall, uh, and it's a topological excitation. Okay, the reason it's topological, we use the word topological, is once you've created a domain wall, there's no amount of local spin flips that you can do to get rid of it. Okay, so once you have a domain wall, it basically is there, it can move around, but you can't get rid of it without doing something very non-local to the system. Okay. And this, uh, so now you might say, okay, well, so the spin flips are, are local and the domain walls are also local. So in some sense, the domain walls are local, even though it takes a non-local number of spins to flip them. If I ask, you know, where's the energy of the system? Well, it's concentrated nice and locally over here. And, you know, this particle has a whirl line just like the spin flip quasi particle. So in some ways it's very similar to the spin flip quasi particle. And in some ways it's very different. And we're gonna talk about that a little more. Okay, so right, I mean, the, the, so, so of course this is a, a sort of cartoon state when J is zero and H is uh, 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 um, infinite. And you know, if you have finite amount of J, you do have some small vibrations, uh, like you say, but uh, again, they're, they're not uh, particles in the sense that there's no conservation for them. And there's, 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 you can't write down a word line theory. But in general, of course, yeah, there, the, uh, there is a gap to create these excitations. The ground state has fluctuations beyond this. Uh, so, so the way you can think of those vibrations is you can think of them as, uh, yeah, yeah, you have virtual spin flips. So the virtual spin flips taking place all the time. Okay, so, yeah, right. so, 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 so this is where I was. I was saying that, you know, you have this ground state and you have these excitations. But there's a very important difference between domain wall quasi particles and spin flip quasi particles, okay? Which is when you do a physical experiment, okay? Which you can think of as a little hammer, you tap your system. And when you tap your system, you always create pairs of domain walls. Okay, so this is very, very important for what I'm gonna discuss. Uh, when you tap your system, you cannot create a single domain wall because creating a single domain wall requires some total non-local operation, which doesn't exist in the experiment. Okay, on the other hand, if you just look at spin flip quasi particles, you can create them uh, locally just by flipping a spin. Uh, 
Okay, so you can create one of them. Here you have to create two. So there's a parity conservation here. Okay, so this similarity between spin flip quasi particles and domain wall quasi particles can actually be put on a very strong mathematical footing. And this is one more of those wonderful things that you know, we all love in many different fields. The idea of duality, and it was invented in the Ising model by Kramers and Warnier in 1941. So I'm not going to go over the math. It's not very hard. If you've taken graduate quantum mechanics, you can learn it. But basically, there's a transformation from these original spin variables to a set of dual variables. Okay, so in this language, they're described in terms of uh, another set of Ising spins, which I call tau. And under this transformation, the Ising model actually maps exactly to another Ising model. But what happens is that this original coupling J and H perpendicular get interchanged in this exchange. Okay, so if you do this twice, you come back to the original model. Okay, so this is a simple transformation that you can learn. Um, and it turns out that this is uh, uh, profound in many ways because, uh, you know, because of the exchange of couplings, a problem which is originally a weak coupling problem becomes a strong coupling problem in the dual variables. And because the Hamiltonians are equal under exchange of these uh, couplings, you can immediately tell, for example, that the critical point of this model is exactly when the ratio of these couplings is one, because that's the point that maps to itself. Okay, and it turns out that in this mapping, domain wall quasi particles become spin flip quasi particles, and spin flip quasi particles become domain wall quasi particles. Okay, so uh, this. Uh, uh, operator sigma, which creates uh, spin flips, if you like, uh, uh, sigma z. In this dual language, uh, it's the tau variables that now create domain walls. So although creating domain walls in the sigma language is very non-local, in the tau language, it becomes completely local. So this transformation with sigma and tau is very non-local. OK, and it turns out, again, duality had a very rich intellectual life going well beyond the Ising model and influencing lots of uh, fields of theoretical physics. Okay, so this brings me to the end of uh, my introduction, which I hope uh, I, I hope that many of you could appreciate. Um, and let me just summarize what uh, this is. And this is a chance for me to advertise my field, uh, condensed matter theory. So here was a you know simple experiment, which was done on a very complicated material, and in a stroke of inspiration, combining the latest science of quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics at the time, Ising wrote down this really simple model in an attempt to explain this experiment, okay? And not only did he do that, but this model had a very rich intellectual history for the next 100 years after it was invented. So it's so simple, that's why I think it's fundamental. Not only did it lead to spontaneous symmetry breaking, it played an important role in the discovery of the renormalization group. It, you know, was central to the discovery of duality. It, there's a lot more stuff. In fact, there's some of it that's even important for this material, but I won't talk about, uh, including, you know, a brilliant solution by Zamolchikov of the conformal field theory that describes the critical point. And then I also discussed how the 2D Ising model, it's convenient to think of it as equivalent to a 1D quantum problem of an Ising chain. And so lots of this interesting, all this interesting physics that you study in the 2D Ising model can also be studied in the 1D Ising chain. Okay, so uh, that's what I have for an introduction. And if, if, if I'm gonna now tell you a little bit about an experiment which realizes this transverse field Ising model and our theory of this experiment. Okay, so if there are any questions, uh, go ahead. Right, so, so, so in ambient conditions, when you do this experiment, there's some small stray magnetic field or something that, so if you, if you wanna make it very precise, you can cool the system down in a magnetic field and then turn the magnetic field to zero. And then it's undoubtedly always aligns along the direction where the magnetic field used to be. So there's this phenomenon of hysteresis. It remembers, even though you turn off the magnetic field, it remembers where it used to point. But in practice, yeah, there may be some ambient, the earth's magnetic field or something that, uh, that 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 makes this choice. Yeah, there are no Goldstone bosons. This is a discrete symmetry. So it turns out you can prove it also in the so in the two D statmec model. 
yeah, and the du duality is absolutely true in the two D icing model. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, so 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 there's you can do a high temperature and low temperature expansion. So low temperature expansion, a domain wall expansion, and you have a wall line expansion, and you can show that they're dual. So you're saying in the statistical mechanics case, you have uh, domain walls, and you're saying what are the dual objects? So it turns out that if you take the Ising model, just the the statistical mechanics model at high temperatures, you can rewrite it as a theory of wall lines, and the wall lines are, look exactly like domain walls, and the wall lines are the same conservation laws. So we we can talk about that. That's a great question. Th that's why I actually started talking about the quantum picture because this it becomes so obvious in the quantum picture in the classical picture it's less obvious but it's also uh, uh, it works out in fact Kramers and Wanya of course discovered it in the classical picture they weren't thinking the quantum picture is easier so even the solution of the 1D Ising model actually in the classical thing which was done originally by Onsaga is considered two other force technical calculation but if you do it actually in this quantum model it's relatively elementary you can teach it, teach it in a two lectures in a graduate student uh, class Okay, so now I gave you a historical example of how complex materials led to fundamental physics, uh, led to the simple model, which then has this really rich intellectual life. So now I'm going to tell you about my own journey where I found a material and I made a model. Uh, of course, I'm not trying to say that it's as profound as the Ising model, but it's fun. It's fun, right? You think about experiments and you have to come up with some model that describes them, and there's an interesting intellectual challenge. Again, I want to acknowledge, first of all, my grad student, Nishita, who, you know, was instrumental in doing this work, as well as my collaborator, Peter Armitage, uh, who did the experiments which actually inspired this uh, theory. Okay, so, uh, and, and I hope that by doing this, I'm also giving you a flavor of just what we do in Kinez Manor. I, I think some of the details of the theory may, may be too technical for this format, but I hope you get some sense of what we're doing. Okay. So the material that we were studying is a very complicated material, unlike iron, which just consists of one atom. This has three different kinds of atoms and ions in it, and they're arranged in a very complicated crystal structure. It has a particular space group. It's an orthorhombic space group. Um, but the important thing for us is not to get bogged down by these details, but uh, there are some chemistry details. Uh, which again, I don't want to get into in this talk, but basically, as far as we're concerned as theorists, or for the level of this talk, we can imagine that each of these cobalt moments carries a little spin half magnetic moment. Okay, so, uh, and niobium and oxygen are basically inert as far as the discussion of this uh, material is concerned at this level. Okay, so if you look at the structure of cobalt niobate in three dimensions, I said it's an orthorhombic crystal, so that has three orthogonal directions. And what happens is these cobalt atoms form chains in the C direction. Yeah, and these chains then form, a, if you look vertically down the C direction in the AV plane, these chains, chains form some lattice. But these chains are quite separated from each other. So each cobalt atom chain, you can think of in the first approximation as basically isolated. Yeah, so this is a very one dimensional material. So all materials that I'm talking about today are three dimensional. But because of the isolation of the chemistry, you can think of this three-dimensional material as a collection of one-dimensional chains, okay? And now there's another fascinating thing about materials is materials have a long history, okay? So this is a synthetic material. It doesn't occur in nature, but it was synthesized first 50 years ago, and then it was revisited 20 years after that, and then some years after that. And then in this really remarkable paper, Radu Koldea showed that this material is a great example of the transverse field Ising model, and in fact, in his paper, he even claimed that it realizes the E8 symmetry that Zamolchikov uh, uh, proposed for the solution of the field theory of the Ising model in the longitudinal field. But um, there's some experimental facts that are important for my talk. And I'm going to skip the review of the neutron scattering data that Radu Koldea has. I can show it later if people are interested. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on Peter's, uh, Peter Armitage's data which we and our interpretation of it. Okay, but this, this paper was certainly very, very important to this uh, field. Okay, so uh, these are some experimental facts that have been known since the 70s, which is what prompted Radu Kolya to get interested in this material. So this magnet is an easy access magnet. It's uh, ferromagnetic along the chains. Uh, 
Uh, it turns out that the way the chains are arranged, the moments lie in the AC plane of the crystal. So if you apply a magnetic field in the B direction, since it's perpendicular to A and C, this could be a good realization of the transverse fieldizing model. Not only that, this is a, a neutron scattering image of the Bragg peak as a function of transverse field taken at very low temperatures at 0.1 Kelvin, much lower than the ordering temperature. And then you can see that as you increase the transverse field, the system at some point ceases to become magnetically ordered. Okay, so because this, this is an easy access magnet, because the crystal structure is one dimensional, and a transverse field destroys magnetism, you might hope that this material is a realization of the transverse field Ising chain. Okay, and in fact, Colde had a lot of evidence. I'm gonna show you our evidence uh, in collaboration with Peter Armitage. Okay, so what is the experiment Peter does? So of course, you know, the Ising model experiment was highly trivial. It's something you could see with your eyes and you could buy the equipment for less than $100. Uh, this experiment is very expensive. Making these crystals is complicated, but let me explain what the experiment roughly does. Okay, so uh, the experiment uses a, a terahertz pulse that it sends incident on the sample, and then it measures the waveform of the transmitted light. Okay, so remarkably, because terahertz oscillations are relatively slow, you can actually measure the waveform in real time. And so this is an example of the waveform in real time. And then if you Fourier transform this, you get the frequency response of the system. So basically the magnetic susceptibility as a function of frequency, okay? So you've, we've learned from the fluctuation dissipation theorem that this dissipative response is related to a correlation function. And you can then associate each of the peaks in this dissipative response to excitations in the magnet, okay, in the material. So this is what you find. Above the ordering temperature, you have some you know, response, which is broad. And below the ordering temperature, which is a blue line, this broad continua breaks up into these discrete resonances. Okay? So what I'm gonna begin by telling you is that this has a very simple interpretation in terms of the Ising model. Okay? So let me explain that in terms of the kind of pictures I showed you. So when you're above the nail ordering temperature of this three-dimensional magnet, you're still at temperatures which are much smaller than the exchange constant of the Ising model. And so you can think of these Ising chains as existing and being ferromagnetically ordered. And now if you, you, know, you send light or whatever your physical perturbation is, you can only create a pair of domain walls. Now, interestingly, the thing about the two domain walls is they have to have a momentum which sums to zero. This is because the wavelength of light is much larger than the lattice spacing of the crystal. And so if you think about a dispersion of domain walls, you have to create two domain walls and they have to sum to zero momentum, but there are many different ways you can do that, right? Because you can raise these energy of the two domain walls, they still have zero momentum, but those have that configuration has different energy. So what I'm trying to convince you is that if you had such a system and you studied the response to the system, it's a broad continuum. Okay, and this is exactly what you see in this red line. This is the two domain wall continuum. So now an interesting question is if you have this two domain wall continuum and you cool it down below the ordering temperature, why does it break up into sharp resonances? Okay, and it turns out there's a very simple, nice piece of theoretical physics that explains this. So let's go back to this picture and let's understand what happens when you cool the system down below the ordering temperature. So when you cool the system below the ordering temperature, the magnet orders, and like you've learned in a StatMec class, that creates a Weiss field, right? When a magnet orders, it creates a self-consistent Weiss field. And how that appears in the transverse field model is it appears as a longitudinal field. Okay, so in, you can add to the transverse field model a longitudinal field. Oops, sorry. Uh, and now if you have a longitudinal field in this experiment, you see that the sp sp like we were in the question that I just answered, you, all the spins will obviously align along the longitudinal field. You create a spin flip. And now if you try and move these two domain walls away from each other, this starts to cost energy, right? Because when you had no longitudinal field, the spins equally like to point up or down. But once you apply a longitudinal field, they prefer to point up. And so the more spins you have to point down, you pay more energy. And so these two domain walls experience a linear confining potential. Yes, okay, so there's a potential that basically doesn't like them to go very far away. At the two particle equation, the center of mass coordinates, this is a very nice problem that you may have remember from quantum mechanics. You'd solve it when you solve the WKV approximation. It's a, when you linearize the potential. It has a solution in terms of airy functions. Okay, and basically because this potential is unbounded, 
all the states become bounded. And that's what these uh, uh, peaks correspond to. They correspond to bound states of the two domain walls in the linear potential. Okay, and so here you, so it turns out that the, uh, you know, if you solve Schrodinger's equation, these eigen, eigen values happen at the zero of airy functions. And it turns out that uh, you can compare this experimental peak locations with the airy function model and it agrees really well. Okay, so now the question we're gonna ask ourselves is what happens to these peaks uh, as you apply a transverse field? Okay, and so this was Peter's data. And actually the interesting thing is I met Peter uh, a few weeks before the pandemic started when he came to give a colloquium at my university. And we weren't even collaborating at that point. And he just had this data, which he didn't understand. And then we started talking about it. And uh, you know, it's a value to having in-person colloquia, right? You start talking and then sometimes things happen. So uh, he had this beautiful data. And unfortunately, maybe the contrast is not very clear over here. But you know, what you see at zero transverse field at high temperature is this con continuum. And then when you go to lower temperatures below the ordering tra transition, you have these little peaks. But these peaks evolve in a strange way when you apply the transverse field. Okay, and in fact, it doesn't look like the transverse field Ising model at all. Yet again, the contrast is not very good over here. But in the transverse field Ising model, you know, when you don't apply a transverse field, the domain walls have no kinetic energy. And then as you apply a transverse field, the kinetic energy keeps in increasing until it becomes so large that the domain walls condense, which is how you get the transition from the magnet to the non-magnetic state in the Ising model. Okay, instead of having that here, you have some very complicated structure where these, uh, peaks move together, then they move apart. And so our goal was to make a theory that describes this. Okay, and to do this, we had to invent a little model, which I'm proud of, and I'm gonna tell you about that little model. Okay, so our inspiration for the model was when you actually look at the crystal structure carefully of this material, it's complicated. And these cobalt atoms actually don't sit on a line. They have a little zigzag structure. Okay, so the translation, the fundamental translation symmetry is not from one cobalt atom to the next, but one cobalt atom to next to next atom. Okay, so uh, if you look at the uh, C, orthorhombic C vector, it's, it, it includes two cobalt atoms. So if you have an Ising interaction between these two spins, now there is a symmetry, if you look in the space group PBCN, that connects these two different bonds. So if you have an Ising axis on this bond, you have to have an Ising axis on this bond, but there's no reason for them to be parallel. So when we write the elementary Ising model, we always assume the Ising axis are parallel. In fact, in this material, the Ising axis don't have to be parallel. And so, but, but of course, if you go to not the next Ising axis, but the next to next Ising axis, those have to be parallel because of this crystal structure. Okay, so that, that, that was the extent of our model. And so we can write this model down. Uh, it's a very simple model. Uh, and it has Ising axis, which alternate from uh, uh, bond to bond. And it turns out these two Ising axis are actually related by a crystal symmetry. So there's an exact symmetry in this space group of this crystal, which is a pi rotation along the B axis. Okay, so if you do a pi rotation along the B axis, uh, about a cobalt site, the even and the odd bonds get interchanged. Okay, and so that means that the Ising axis on the even and odd bonds are related by a pi rotation along the B axis. And so here I've shown a picture of what the Ising axis could be with respect to the crystallographic uh, uh, axes. Okay, so, 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 so anyway, I, I, I know that some of this may, may, may be too technical, but I, but I just wanna in, show you how, you know, we come up with these models, but it really requires understanding the details of experiments and uh, uh, chemistry that go into uh, these materials. Okay, so this is an interesting model. Now, it's like an Ising model, but it has this uh, alternating crystal, uh, alternating direction. So in fact, you know, it's similar in spirit to a model that was introduced by Kitaev, which is very popular. So in fact, Ono is telling me about it and is one of the world experts on this subject. Um, but Kitaev's model, of course, was in two dimensional honeycomb lattice. This is in one dimension. And there's no symmetry in the crystal that enforces that N1 and N2 should be perpendicular to each other like they are in the Kitaev model. So we call this model the twisted Kitaev model. Uh, and now we can ask, what is the ground state of this model? Uh, just like how we saw the Ising model has these simple ground states. So this model is frustrated, right? You can't make both uh, N1 or even an odd bonds happy. So what the system does, is it decides to polarize as a ferromagnet in the direction which is in between N1 and N2. 
So if I rewrite the model in the axis, which is uh, this Z direction, which is the direction of the polarization, it turns out that this weird and interesting term that appears that you normally don't write down when you write down. So, you know, here's something where you're kind of forced to think about some weird term, even normally you wouldn't think about it as a theorist, but the details of this material make you think about this term. And um, it is allowed by symmetry in this crystal. Yeah, so uh, remember when you interchange, if you do a pi rotation along the B axis, which is the X axis in this uh, spin basis, um, that'll keep tau X fixed, but it'll change the sign of tau Z, but it interchanges the even and odd terms. And there's an oscillating phase to this term, uh, which makes the even and odd sides have opposite signs. So if you do the whole transformation, this term is actually invariant. Okay, so let's study what the effect of this term is. And it turns out this term has some very interesting effect on the domain walls of the Ising model. Okay, so because of this minus one to the I, it turns out that if a domain wall hops from side to side, when it hops on the even sides, it has a plus one phase. And when it hops on the odd sides, it has a minus one phase. Okay, so this uh, is very reminiscent of uh, the Sue Schrieffer Heger model of polyacetylene which uh, some of you have, is sort of the progenitor of topological insulators. Um, and the uniform transverse field just corresponds to a uniform hopping of this, uh, of the domain walls on this chain. Okay, so the, there's a parallel with Sushri for Higa's model of polyacetylene. Okay, so now what we can do is we can diagonalize the kinetic energy of the domain walls. And because they have this strong weak structure, there are actually two bands of domain walls. So for every value of energy, there uh, momentum, sorry, the two different domain wall energies. And so when a, 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 a light comes and flips spin, a photon, sorry, not a light, a photon comes and flips a spin, it creates two domain walls. And then the system has to decide whether the two domain walls are both in the higher band, one is in the higher band, one is in the lower band, and both are in the lower band, right? It has three different options. And as it does this, it has different regions of energy and momentum which are allowed. Uh, and you know, in the simple model, you can just calculate this. And now if you look at the uh, experiment, this looks a lot like how the experiment uh, uh, looks. Okay, so, so this is encouraging. But in order to do a full calculation, we have to take our quantum model uh, and we need to go beyond perturbation theory. So that picture that I showed you over here, this is the effective uh, perturbation theory uh, of this model in the domain wall space. I'm doing degenerate perturbation theory. But really what we need to do is go beyond that. And so we use density matrix renormalization group. So this by itself is, you know, it's an incredible algorithm to simulate quantum problems in one dimension that use ideas from quantum information. And basically the idea is that you store the wave function as a matrix product state. And then you study the time evolution of this matrix product state. So contrast is not very good over here. And again, I'm using the fluctuation dissipation theorem even though the experiment measures a dissipated response, I can think of it in terms of uh, a two-point correlation function. And so here's the real time domain. So, you know, you, you, you take this ferromagnetic ground state and then you hit it with this S operator and that creates this uh, disturbance over here. So maybe we are with the lights out up oh, there. Okay. Thank you, it looks a little nicer. And now if you Fourier, Fourier transform this time data, you get nice peaks. Okay, so this is exactly reminiscent of what you have in the experiment. These are two domain wall bound states that form because of the linear confining potential. And then you can study it as a function of the transverse field. And so in the bottom is our theory and the top is the experiment. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly show you. So, so, so not only does the theory and experiment agree, but we have a nice interpretation of what happens. Okay, so you see that there's this narrowing of the lowest bandwidth of the domain walls. And that's really because you have this uh, strong, weak, strong, weak uh, hopping of the domain walls. And at some point, the weak bonds actually have no kinetic energy and the domain walls get completely localized. And that's how you can understand this feature over here. Okay, and then at low temperatures where this breaks up into resonances, uh, how am I doing the time? Uh, okay, good, good, good. Uh, this breaks up into resonances. Uh, you know, again, you can understand these resonances by understanding whether both domain walls on the lower band or whether one is in the lower band and one's in the higher band. Okay, so I want to finish by coming back to Kramer's one-year duality. 
Okay, so, so, so we built a model now for this uh, data over here. This goes up to three Tesla. Now notice that in this picture, uh, this is one milli electron volt. And so really the Ising transition happens when this lowest thing goes all the way to zero. So if this is three, this is two, this is one zero somewhere over here. Okay, so you have to go to much larger fields than three Tesla. And unfortunately this experiment that Peter did could only go to three Tesla. So there's a less precise experiment uh, which his collaborators in Estonia could do to larger magnetic fields. And I'm gonna show you some experimental data from that experiment. And you can study the domain wall condensation. Okay, so in Estonia, they seem to plot the frequency on the x-axis instead of on the y-axis. So you have to rotate your, your, your frame. And you know if you look at it sideways, it looks like the old picture. So let's look at it sideways. And you know first, when you have a small magnetic field, you know this is that feature where the domain walls narrow. And then they start going down low in energy. And so this is the Ising transition where domain walls condense. And then you have a gap again, and this is the gap to spin flip quasi particles. Okay, so uh, you have uh, all these features, and this is also done with terahertz, but it's not done in time domain. Okay, so it's so the accuracy, the is the resolution is not so good, but you can go to larger magnetic field. And so what you can do is you can fit this data by locating the peak, and then you see that this is the closing of the domain wall energy, and this is the gaining of the spin flip quasi particle energy, right? So if you use a standard theory of critical phenomena, even though this model is not the Ising model, close to critical point, it has the same symmetry behavior. And so by universality, it should be described by the same critical exponents. And we know very well how the gap closes in the Ising model, right? It's given by an exponent of one. So the gap closing, closing is linear, and this data looks nice and linear. But there's something more interesting than the linear closing of the gap which is that, remember, under uh, Kramer's one-year duality, domain walls get mapped into spin-flip quasi-particles, and spin-flip quasi-particles get mapped into domain walls. So that means that as you approach the critical point, the gap to create domain walls must be identical to the gap to create spin-flip quasi-particles. Okay? So uh, that would seem to indicate, sorry, that both these gaps go to zero at the same rate. But there's another interesting fact is that in an experiment, you can only create a pair of domain walls, right? Whereas in an experiment, you can create single spin flip quasi particles. So both of these gaps should go to zero linearly, but if you take the ratio of these gaps, which is a universal amplitude ratio, it must be exactly equal to two, right? And this quantization is basically uh, related to the duality of domain walls with spin flip quasi particles and the topological conservation of domain wall parity, which is to say that if you take a system with no domain walls, you can only create two or four or six domain walls, right? And so if we uh, take these slopes over here, um, you get something very close to two. So in condensed matter, this is high precision, by the way. And I, I know people have higher standards in high energy physics, but 10-15% uh, accuracy is considered uh, amazing. But this is 5%. And so this is direct evidence for the Kramer's one-year duality. In fact, this is maybe the first time I think the Kramer's one-year duality. I mean, it was it was a cute theoretical observation in Kramer's and one-year time, uh, and now it uh, you know we can actually observe it in nature. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk, uh, um, and I just want to conclude again with perspective. So you know, I began by telling you about the Ising model and how you know studying some something that seems you know, relatively mundane, like how magnets lose their magnetization, led to some really profound theoretical physics. And then I gave you a more humble example of how studying some terahertz optics experiment on a particular complicated material led us to the simple model of uh, Ising model with uh, spin directions that vary. And then you have this interesting Sushri for Higa domain wall physics. And I thought I'd just conclude by telling you a little bit about the field that I work in, in quantum magnetism and Onur works in. Uh, it's a really exciting field um, in part because of course I gave you just, so, you know, I think one of the things that people find a little jarring about condensed matter is when you ask someone, what's the most important question in condensed matter, two condensed matter theorists will never agree. In fact, you know, there is no most important question. There's too many questions. Uh, and part of that is because materials are just incredibly diverse. So I told you about one material, cobalt niobate, there are thousands and thousands, thousands of different materials, synthetic materials, two-dimensional van der Waal materials, engineered heterostructures. There's just too much stuff that happens, okay? 
At the same time, you know, I showed you this incredibly, so this, this probe that I discussed, this you know, time-dependent terahertz spectroscopy is a very new probe. You can't just go and buy an instrument that does it. Uh, and there's all kinds of other probes. There's the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, there's, you know, some beautiful X-ray stuff that's taking place that I heard about uh, uh, this morning here at Arizona. So there's all these developments taking place, and all of these are giving us a, you know, greater insight into quantum materials. At the same time, there's lots of interesting theoretical developments. There's the Kitayev model. There's quantum criticality. Uh, you know, that have taken place in the last 10 years. And I showed you some nice numerical data using density matrix renormalization group. We're learning new quantum algorithms to simulate quantum models. And this little project that we had, you know, combined all these things into one. But of course, this is just one amongst hundreds and hundreds of thousands of projects that are taking place that are, you know, studying interesting aspects of physics combining both theory and experiment. Okay, so with that, let me conclude and say that uh, I give you a little introduction to the Ising model and the fundamental physics in the Ising model. I spoke about this little twisted Kitayev model and our DMRG simulations of it and how some fundamental physics appears in cobalt niobate. Thank you so much. <laughs>